Hey guys, what's it going to do here? I am back for another video today. We are delving into the missing 411 cases. More specifically, the baffling disappearance of Paula Weldon in the Bennington Triangle area. So there's a couple of things I want to unpack before we get into the case. So missing 411, what is that? According to the missing 411 subreddit, missing 411 is the name of a non-fiction book series series and documentary by former police investigator David Paulides that documents unsolved cases of people going missing in national parks and forests all under similar circumstances. David Paulides created Can-Am Missing Project, an organisation dedicated to understanding the complexity and issues of searching, rescuing and investigating people missing in the wilds of the world. The project initially started as a meeting with a park ranger and slowly evolved into a study on missing people who vanished in the wild. Wild, many under highly unusual circumstances. We found that many of the cases we've researched, parents and relatives of the victims believe a kidnapping had occurred. Law enforcement and the media usually do not publicise concerns of kidnapping or abduction when the missing can be explained through traditional means. There are too many of these cases to ignore and there is a consistency to the stories. David was asked in an audio interview, what does missing 411 mean? It seems like, a, you know, with the word missing and then a random number. Well it isn't because he said it's kind of a play on words. First of all for everyone that's old like me 411 means you call information. Missing 411 is another way of saying missing information. Another way of saying that we're not getting everything. So basically a missing 411 case from what I can gather is someone goes missing in a national park or a forest area and we're not getting all of the information as to the disappearance. They could be kidnapped. In today's example the Bennington Triangle is a bit of a Bermuda Triangle type scenario but in the forest in the Bennington area where people have been going missing consistently for decades. There has also been a very large number of people claimed to have seen UFOs over the area. There have been Bigfoot sightings, strange creatures seen in there. It seems to be quite the paranormal hotspot. Which brings us to the strange disappearance of Paula Weldon. So as I was saying, the Bennington Triangle is in an area in southwest Vermont. This area is centered around the Glastonbury Mountain Range. No relation to the music festival. Now there are actually some towns neighboring this area. Bennington, Woodford, Shaftesbury and Somerset. And this triangle seemed to have had an effect on those towns. For example, Somerset was once quite a bustling town. There was a bit of industry going through there. It was once seen as quite a thriving area to live. But towards the end of the 19th century, it began to decline rapidly. And now, in 2020, it's essentially a ghost town. Now, on top of the Bennington Triangle being quite a UFO hotspot, apparently the Native Americans refused to settle there as they said the lands were cursed. So where does Paula Weldon come into this? Well, on Sunday, December 1st, 1946, Paula Jean Weldon, who was just 18 at the time, had finished her job for the day at the Bennington College of Vermont. She'd worked two shifts back to back and returned to her dorm to get changed because she fancied going for a long hike. She saw her roommate as she was getting changed and told her what she was doing. She was just gonna go for a long hike because in recent days, she'd been feeling a little bit down and depressed. It was also noted by the roommate that she didn't actually go home for Thanksgiving, which would imply that there was an issue in her family life. Paula was the eldest of four daughters. She was around five foot five inches tall and weighed around 123 pounds. She was quite an active person. She enjoyed many sports and many outdoor activities, including hiking. It was kind of a thing that she did to relax, which would explain why she wanted to go on that long hike. Now that day, it's reported that she was wearing a red parka jacket with a fur trimmed hood, blue jeans, white trainers, and a gold watch. Now when she ventured out it was around 10 degrees Celsius but by the evening time in the wind it dropped to what would feel like around minus 12. She was seen by several students on her way to Route 67A. She was seen by Danny Fager walking down the drive out of the college entrance at around 2.30pm. 
She was picked up by our friend Louise Knapp at 2.45 p.m. and driven to about three miles away from the trail that she was going for this hike. Around 30 minutes later, about 4 p.m., Ernest Whitman and three friends claimed to have seen her. Paula actually approached these students and asked them about the trail ahead. She asked how long the trail would be. Once she got her answer, she headed off towards the bridge leading to the trail. Now after this time period, several other people claim to have seen her, but the reliability of these claims remain uncertain. Now you gotta imagine this is December, so around 4.15, 4.30, the night time is quickly descending, and with that, so is the temperature. And she's not really dressed appropriately, she's got relatively light clothing, not many layers on for this kind of temperature. She had no supplies with her either, and after 4 p.m., she was never seen again. Now after she failed to turn up for her classes on Monday morning, a member of staff at the college called the state attorney to the college as well as Paula's father. Now working off the information that Paula had gone for a long hike as well as Paula saying several times to several people that she would like to go to a certain cave in the mountainous area, a gentleman called Henry Steele who was a farm worker and a few students headed off to go and try and locate her. They arrived at the cave area, searched it, but found nothing. Now there were many different alleged sightings of her. There was a taxi driver who claimed he picked up a student and took her to the train station, but again, couldn't verify if it was actually her or not. There were several buses that she could have taken from there, but no one working on the buses could recognize her, but they did say it was an incredibly busy day that day as well, so she could have got on the bus. Interestingly, a waitress at the modern restaurant on Pleasant Street called Aura Teletier served a girl matching Paula's description on the day that she went missing at 9.30 in the evening. Now, she said that the girl was with a young man around the age of 25 and he appeared very abusive. Now, when the man in a drunken state went to the counter to pay, apparently Aura was signalled over to the young lady at the table. It was there that the lady he asked how far Bennington, Vermont was and then asked where she was at that point in time. So obviously she was not aware of where she was. She said that she had to get to Bennington and she had arrived in Fall River with a thousand dollars but that money had all now dried up. Aura said that the girl had not been drinking but she came across a bit dazed. Now that evening, the media put a story and a picture out. The Massachusetts and New York authorities were alerted. A picture was circulated, but no formal search and rescue effort was actually started at that point. I think it's worth noting at this point that the investigation into this case has been heavily, heavily criticized. Now on Tuesday, December 3rd, the manager of Vermont Transit said he would contact every single bus driver in the area and ask them if they had seen this girl, if this girl had got on any of their buses. Searches were carried out on the college campus and a large section of the long trail she was going on was searched. Many, many people got involved in this search. All in all, over 500 people tried their hardest to try and locate Paula. They were even so desperate at one point they enlisted the help of a clairvoyant, Clara Jepson, who took them to a bridge, but nothing was found. It was later determined that the girl that the waitress saw was not, in fact, Paula. The authorities concluded that there were two women out that evening with similar descriptions in the area of the long trail that day. Paula and another woman who was with the man in the diner. They both fitted Paula's description, however the other woman was considerably taller than five foot five inches, and this may have caused considerable confusion with the witnesses, as some would have seen this other lady thinking it was Paula, and led the authorities down leads that would go nowhere. By the Wednesday, the president of the college issued a statement claiming that he felt foul play was at hand here, and that the body may well have been concealed. Of course, this is a popular trail, and many people come and go through that area. By December 5th, 
Searches began at dawn in a seven square mile area between Bald and Glastonbury Mountains. Over 125 people from the Bennington and Williams College, as well as locals, assisted in the search, led by Sheriff Clyde Peck. Five aircraft were deployed, as well as 120 men from the State Guard, meaning that nearly 500 people in total were involved in the search. Each searcher dropped confetti on the area that they had searched so that no area was searched twice. And thorough searches of the areas where it's thought that she would have definitely gone to during her trail, as well as areas that she'd spoken about in the past. However, the 500 searchers found nothing, and so it was concluded that she wasn't there. At the time, her father said that he was satisfied that this search had been conducted well. On December 15th, the search was stopped. In the following May, by the time the snow had all melted, her father put on another two day search and again, nothing was found. It was then that he criticized the lack of sophistication that the investigators put on in the search of his daughter. So, what happened to Paula? The answer is unfortunately nobody knows, but of course there are many many theories. As I said, this happened in the Bennington Triangle, an area where the Native Americans would never tread, the Native Americans would never settle because it is cursed lands. Claims of monsters, Bigfoot, creatures of the night in those woods, UFO sightings, vicious animals that we're bears for example, you know, these kind of things. It could be a logical explanation like she had a run-in with a bear, however there was no traces found and there would certainly be blood, a rag of clothing or something for the investigators to find. Was she abducted by aliens? I know it sounds ridiculous but there have been considerable amount of sightings over that area and a considerable amount of people that haven't just gone missing, there haven't been traces left. These people have disappeared off the face of the earth. There was also claims that it could have been a serial killer in the area which would explain why so many people have gone missing in the same vicinity. But again, you would think that at some point, surely there would be traces left behind. Did she just up and leave and start a new life? Or maybe because those forests are so dense, maybe she is still in there somewhere and she just hasn't been discovered yet. I would love to know what you guys think. What do you think might have happened to Paula in 1946? Guys, if you enjoy the missing 411 cases, there are so many of them, I will happily cover them for you. I'll get the bizarre ones, the unexplainable ones, the ones that will just make you think what on earth happened there. If you enjoy this guys, please leave a like, subscribe, share the videos. I really do appreciate it. This has been my first missing 411 video. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you'd like to support me guys, Patreon is an amazing way to do that. The link for that is down below. I also stream on twitch.tv forward slash duty rhino. I really appreciate your support guys. Thank you so much. I'll see you very soon. Sweet one geese.